the waking up process in the ultimate sense takes place in the mind. It's from looking at the false beliefs in the mind without fear, calmly looking on them and just seeing them as false. And that's, those questions about, a lot of times those come in about, you know, being here and Gosh, I'm getting, I've had people come up to me in seminars that are elderly or something, and they'll, they'll say, I'm, if only I had had this book <laughs> when I was young, you know, or da 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 But it's still this age time concepts that are very much tied up in the ego system. And, and, the, and the age of the body or the passion of the body has no, has no effect on the mind. And it's the mind that's to be, that's to be healed. Mm-hmm. And since the uh, you know the illusion of the body has nothing to do with that, then mm-hmm. then if the body stops breathing, it still has nothing to do with that. But if we have to work on stuff and become aware, like Carol was saying, we have to use these experiences in order to gain awareness, and we have to have another body. Or does it continue when we make a transition? Well, basically. Jesus at one point says that only salvation can be said to cure, and one either wakes or sleeps. And it says, at one point he says, many upon death rise and wake and, at that point. You know, in that sense, he's using death in a sense of the body. It could be any instant. <laughs> Just one instant it takes to wake up. But, but really what I hear you saying is, is that, you know, what's the use? of this world, you know, and, and the Course is definitely saying, though the world was made as a projection, as a distracted device, keep your mind busy and preoccupied with things in the world, with pain and pleasure and pursuits and on and on and on, even though it was made as a distracted device so that the mind wouldn't look at the beliefs, this is meant to cover over the false beliefs, so you, the attention remains focused out here, that the Holy Spirit has a different purpose for the world that even though it was made for that purpose, that was the ego's purpose. Now the Holy Spirit says, here, I've got a different purpose, healing. <laughs> We're going to use these bodies. We're going to use these whatever, cars, houses, trees, clothes, everything. We're going to use those in the waking up process. And that's the whole idea of training the mind to start to bring a single purpose to everything. That's probably the, the most difficult thing to grasp. I, I've had people ask, as we've even taught classes for weeks and weeks and they'll say, now let me go over this again. There's a purpose that the Holy Spirit has for the world. Would you tell me what that is? <laughs> again. And I'm glad to know that. And I'm seeing it with more experience too. And, and it's like, I mean, this is it, after we've been at it for like weeks of going through the workbook. And the reason it seems so vague, that purpose, and that so uh, abstract and everything, is that, that it's impossible to hold that purpose while the mind holds on to other purposes that the ego purposes that are given to the world to get things for its own sake and accumulate and all those things we've all we recognize that part in us that just loves you know, the old thrill about getting something or when I was a kid you know going to Coney Island that place would bring me happiness and salvation <laughs> I didn't use the word salvation but I was awful happy from that place or particular rides or whatever we've all had that sense that there are other goals and purposes that are that are in our mind and they obscure our function. They obscure that, that abstract purpose. That purpose is what brings the fusion that we talked about. about. But as long as it's kind of a, as long as I'm going to hold tight to the corral, then gradually as I open the corral door, that purpose starts getting more and more clear in my awareness. It just moves through me. It just, literally, of course, as the Holy Spirit will tell you what to do and where to go and, and what to say. Wow. You know, it's like that gives a sense of ease and effortlessness where I won't have to be struggling with each decision that I make, that there'll be this presence that'll start moving through me. So that's, that's, the Course calls it one in ten, it calls it singleness of purpose, it's it called um, goal. There's a passage I think I mentioned last time, the peace of God is my one goal, the aim of all my living here, the end I seek, my purpose and my function in my life. That's coming in something <laughs> but it's like he's, he's holding it in there he's saying it's there it's the Holy Spirit in your mind and he's guiding you to let go of all these other um, goals that, that block your purpose from your mind and releasing what's in the corral those attachments um, is what makes room for that one intent or that one purpose to be really what the mind is riveted on 
because the mind will, you know, rivet on what is desired. And if what's in the corral is what's desired, that's what the mind, the attention is given to. And if that's released, then the mind is freed up to rivet itself on that one purpose. So it's kind of like to get to, to that one purpose, it's letting go of those attachments in the corral. Yeah. The ego would have us, have us believe that to open up the corral is to make ourselves vulnerable. Right. But to the ego, that, that is very threatening. Right. That, that always struck me too in a lot of the readings I read, you know, where they always talk about risk honesty. And, you know, one day, it just as I was reading the Course, it, it dawned on me those two words, risk honesty. <laughs> I mean, true honesty. It seems that way at the beginning because to the ego, honesty is a threat. <laughs> total consistency, total laying aside deceptions. The ego says, hey, I can't be honest. I'll be out of business. <laughs> my whole my whole existence, so to speak, the ego is based on mirrors and schemes and games. And, and total honesty is, is this consistency of thought and action and word and deed that the ego is very afraid of. So it really does seem that way at the beginning. It seems like... It's there's a real vulnerability, and it seems like it's a risk. If you've been used to repressing, then it still feels like one. It right. feels like one. Right. But if it doesn't, then it's like it's like more of a an accepted growth. I don't know how to say that. Mm -hmm. Was there a particular question or aspect of relationship that you wanted addressed, or, or, or well? Um, yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm ready for that. Um, uh, I'd like to address the, um, the relationship of, um, what do you call it, special, special relationships. Um, um, I'd like to understand more about what those relationships are for and, and why they're here. And, um, you know, just, I, I really didn't know anything about it, and um, I'm just now reading about that in the course. Mm -hmm. And I understand you guys have done some work on that. Well, if we just go back to the metaphysics and kind of look at why specialness was made or why special relationships were made, I think I addressed in the first one, but I'll address it again, that, that in a sense, once the separation seemed to occur in an instant, it was answered <laughs> in an instant. And that answer was the Holy Spirit in our minds. So that's how quick that this world lasted as one instant. But it's like the ego wants to call forth, wants to keep the mind invested in believing that, that, that the past is still here. The ego use of time is it says, skip over the present. You're guilty in the past. And it's been that way for a long time. It's not going to change. You know, it's that depressing kind of a thinking where it's like it's been bad in the past and it's going to be bad in the future. And you don't have any power to change it, kind of a victim. Right? Whereas the Holy Spirit says, now is your point of power, so to speak. That right now, you can get in touch with things, with beliefs. You can make decisions. You can be open to another way of seeing and looking at right now. And the Holy Spirit uses the past to, to bring the mind to the holy instant. And the way this relates metaphysically is that we mentioned that the, the belief of separation occurred and was answered in an instant. And the ego's, so to speak, answer to the, to the correction or to the Holy Spirit was the special relationship. Because this is a way of, of seeming to provide something outside, something on the screen that is so attractive that the mind won't want to go within to that light. It wants, wants to get caught up in something there. And, and the dynamics beneath it is, it's, it's like, now that the mind buys this belief in separation, and it actually is afraid of the light, afraid of the Holy Spirit at this point, when the darkened mind is, because it believes that it actually pulled off the separation. It actually did this, pulled off the impossible, which is separate from its, its creator, which is really a horrifying thought. And to believe in that is just a, is very horrifying. And that's this ontological guilt and fear that it's buried really, really deep within the mind. So we'll just call this, this is the belief in separation. So now a self-concept, a world and personhood, and I'm now a person in a world, all this, all these ideas and beliefs are learned and, and built up on here to cover over that cornerstone. 
Because the ego says that if, if you go to that cornerstone and you lift that cornerstone, then God's going to be there. And, and the ego says you really did it. You separated from God, and he will get you. He will, he will come after you for what you've done. You've actually stolen from heaven or you've pulled yourself away from the kingdom. You know, and he's angry about it. So the ego keeps screeching, don't ever, ever, ever go near that cornerstone. We'll make a bunch of beliefs. We'll build a world that you can become involved in and that you won't ever go back to that point. And the special relationships, those are the things that are part of the, the dream world that, um, that are very attractive. In other words, we, there are, the Course talks about special hate relationships and special love relationships. And the special hate relationships are the obvious ones. More, it's not quite so insidious or difficult to see because it gets back to that projection that we've been talking about before. You've got this guilt, the ego says, unload it. You don't like this person. Get get out of get them out of your life. <laughs> get as far away as you can from them. You know, but you know it's okay to hate some people. The ego counsels, and that's its way of dumping the guilt and, and getting rid of and blaming. But the special love is the flip side, where is I I seek for a partner or I seek for persons, whether they be children or spouses or parental relationships or best friends or whatever, that will make me forget about all this unconscious stuff, that I can stay so distracted in form, I can stay so distracted with them, and I can make a bargain, you know, with them, and that even if I can get them to meet my needs a lot of the time, they will serve as a God substitute, you know. But still the mind is deceived and it believes that it's lacking, you know, it still believes that it's been kicked out of the kingdom and everything, so it's like, well, it says, go for what you can, you know, eat, drink, and be merry, <laughs> or you're going to die, and and get as many people and friends that, that, that can be these close. Sometimes only one, or sometimes a focus of a group. Um, you know, it can be, it can, special relationships can come in lots of ways. Or it could even be with things, you know, where, you know, I'm fed up with all kinds of people. I don't want to go near men or women again. I've had enough of that pain. I'm just going to go find myself a good mountain and build myself a log cabin and get myself some quilts or knitting or something I like to do and heck with it. You or, know, animals. or animals. Or animals. Uh, any kind of pursuit, academics, I'll become the smartest, whatever, the best botanist in the world, or whatever career. It doesn't so much matter what it is, but, but that's why it, it's set up that way. And that's where the codependency comes in, because at a very deep level, the deceived mind is looking for completion in that other person. And it can't succeed. It's, the whole thing is set up from the word go. It can't succeed in that extent, because it can seem to succeed for... You have a mirage of, of having everything. But in a way, it's like the ego is saying in there, you know, it's a cruel, vicious world. I mean, never mind that it's, it's just a world that I just see, I just perceive exactly what I think I want to find, whatever I selectively choose in the world, which is the fact of it. But the ego says it's a cruel, vicious world out there. People are out to get you. You know, the government and the IRS, and you've got people that are always treating you bad at work or here or there. And if you can find a haven, if you can just find that one person, just one person or, or a couple people that, that you know, you can always talk to and it won't beat you up and it won't attack you and everything, then build your home, build your security on that relationship with that other person. And so, you know, so it's like we have our, our basket and our emotional eggs and we start saying, this is it. This is the haven that will do it. And we go click, clink, clink. We start putting our investments and everything on, on the life we're going to live together and, and how it's going to be. We keep loading them in and building this up and everything. And then, invariably, they seem to leave. They seem to die. They seem to get sick. They seem to be going through trauma. And we're so emotionally invested and codependent with them that we seem to go down the cesspool with them. And it's because, in the ultimate sense, it's been set up from the beginning that they've they've been set up as a God substitute and there is no body ever that will serve as a, as a, as a God substitute it's set up for the basket to drop it's the ego has yeah, set the thing up yeah. now the Holy Spirit says okay this is where you think you are and they seem to be set up destructively but, but I can bring a touch of heaven to them I can bring a purpose so that you can bring a, a, that purpose that we've been talking about to that relationship. You can literally turn the, the relationship